Hi, thank you for tuning in. Today I'm going to present the work of my, of my recently graduated student, Ms. Alinda Lopez Acosta. And this work has been done in collaboration with Jennifer Hutchings and Angela Bliss from Oregon State University. In this talk, I'm going to focus on CI's focus on CI social interactions at the meso to sub scale range in the marginalized zones of the Arctic Ocean. And what you're seeing right now in your screen is an example of the type of satellite remote sensing imagery that we use to derive observations from. So the main issue with this type of data sets is the imprint of atmospheric conditions, which impedes the easy acquisition of CI's observations. The methodology that we've developed allows us to filter this noise and acquire, acquire measurements of the ice and the whole goal is to uh, be able to use or leverage this information to infer the characteristics of the oceanic turbulence uh, underneath from, uh, that's, that's developing underneath the ice. So as we know, eddies are everywhere in the ocean and understanding their role in transporting nutrients and transferring energy has been a main focus in oceanography in the last decade. Unfortunately, the observations remain sparse and in the polls, the problem is compounded by the fact that sea ice ocean interactions are coupled, which means that to understand any dynamics, you also need to have a good sense of how the sea ice cover behaves. So to solve this problem, we developed a new methodology to analyze sea ice imagery from NASA's MODIS data set, which is the longest continuous record of Earth, with the aim to characterize the sea ice field and leverage this information to quantify the characteristics of the ocean turbulent eddy field underneath the ice. I'm not going to go into details regarding our method, so you can go and, and visit our paper, which I'm putting here and below this, this, this slide if you're interested. Uh, but just to give you a sense of the type of measurements that we're able to retrieve, uh, this is a brief summary. So the, the, the images that we're using have a resolution of 250 meters per pixel, which allows us to successfully identify ice fields ranging from 8 to 65 kilometers and retrieve their geometries. With this geometrical information, we're able to provide daily acquisitions of ice flow shapes and sizes. Now, using our feature matching approach, we retrieve multi day Lagrangian ice flow trajectories, notwithstanding large sea ice rotations in marginal islands. And because we are also implementing a multi step tracking method, we retrieve information even if heavy cloud cover limits visibility. And so in this center panel, what you're seeing are uh, an example of Lagrangian trajectories that we acquired along the eastern Greenland coast. And you're seeing them in multiple colors just for clarity. And all of them have at least 30, multi 30 days of observations. And these span the years from 2002 to 2020. Um, a unique, a, a unique element of our product is that given that we're able to examine the shape of identified ice flows in sequential images, we're able to retrieve their angular velocity. And so for the first time, we have a, a way to quantify how ice is rotating over time for long periods of time. And so in the lower left panel, what you're seeing there are three examples of the trajectories of three flows that we were able to track and how they are rotating. So the colors um, represent a certain level of rotation. Uh, we also compute Eulerian seasonal and monthly mean velocity fields by resampling our data on a 20 kilometer grid. And finally, we also analyze the dynamical structure of the sea ice field by absolute and relative dispersion characteristics from residual ice flow positions. So today I'm going to be focusing on this last variable for the rest of my talk. Um, and so understanding the CI dynamical regime of marginal ice zones is essential to properly constrain numerical models. Uh, the fact that oceanic and atmospheric forcing exhibits turbulent behavior inspired the application of Lagrangian statistics to study, to study uh, the CI's field. And so the study of absolute dispersion is based on the assumption that the motion of sea ice can have, well, has a predictable and a stochastic part that is well-defined. So one is associated with the mean field and the other to fluctuations caused by the eddy field. And this makes sense because in the end, sea ice is being forced by two turbulent flow, flow fields, one the atmospheric and the other one the oceanic field. 
And so here we are borrowing uh, techniques used in turbulence, in analyzing turbulent, turbulent flow fields to understand um, the structure of the sea ice field. And that will allow us to draw, draw, draw conclusions of what possibly could be forcing the, 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 the sea ice field. Assuming now that for these ranges of ice flows, the atmospheric flow field is mostly uniform, uh, the inferences that we're able to make is that whatever structures we're observing in the sea ice field are likely to be caused by oceanic structures. And so we're going to start with a very simple definition, which is uh, that of a single particle or absolute dispersion which is simply defined by the mean square, dis uh, mean square displacement. Um, so taking the average over an ensemble of that. And so this essentially tells us how a single particle is, how, how, how it is moving away from an initial position. And what we're interested in, in, in or, or what will, will be the center of this analysis is the power law exponent and how it relates to the dynamical structure of the flow. So here I'm putting two simple examples to illustrate this point. Uh, in one, the blue line, for example, follows a uh, uh, power law of T squared. And this is uh, representative of advection with long range correlations. So for example, a ballistic regime. And that's what you would observe, uh, for example, in, a, in, a, in the Eastern Greenland current, which is the, the current that's flowing southwards along the Eastern Greenland coast. Uh, for an ice flow that perhaps is moving along, along the current. Now, um, another example of a different regime would be the one characterized by a five-fourths power law, and that is representative of shear and stretching dominated flow, uh, also known as a hyperbolic regime. And that would be associated with meso to sub mesoscalarity. So for example, ice flows that are rotating clearly across the mean flow or um, that those would be expected to follow a regime that's closer to that five fourths law. So we did an analysis of the whole duration of the MODIS database base, so from 2003 to 2020. And what we observed is a clear, um, a, yeah, all the years clearly follow a five fourths um, regime in that case. So here you are seeing um, all the years groups uh, in different bins. And, and we're observing cons consistently that five fourth power law um, rate, uh, in for, for time scales ranging from one to 24 days. We also bind all the observations into a single ensemble and we observe the same trend, trend from one to 41 days. Um, so in marginal ice zones where meso and sub -meso scale eddies are known to influence the surface dynamics, this behavior clearly indicates the effects of hyperbolic or elliptical regions of coherent structures and sea ice drift. Um, so to the right, I'm, um, for your reference, I'm including the study by Gabrielle et al. in 2014, where they also observed a similar behavior for, um, for different in-situ field instruments, in this case, the IABP and the FRAMSI uh, data set. So, so the difference between our observations and the ones that are here to the right is that we're, because of the amount of sea ice uh, flows that we're able to observe at any given time, we, can, we, we have enough observations to, um, to resolve uh, decadal trends. Whereas because of the uh, restricted, restricted amount of in-situ measurement, the one to the right is binning all possible um, or all available instruments over the whole, um, yeah, over, over time. We also uh, looked at the PDF of the fluctuating velocities, which we defined following the study by Gabrielski as the um, velocities that were going across, across the mean flow. And we observed a uh, deviation from Gaussianity um, so it's, it's obvious that our PDFs have very long tails. And so tails are usually linked to intermittent, to intermittency in the flows, which means that they are um, sporadic, intense events, which are usually associated with turbulent eddies. 
is more evidence to the point that um, the ice flows here in this case are rotating due to the oceanic flow field underneath, which most likely is characterized by the presence of meso and submesoscale turbulent eddies. Um, we went ahead and were able, we, we wanted to compare um, the characteristics of the sea ice field. So for example, measurements of sea ice extent with the velocities and the, the distribution properties of the sea ice field and see how well they compared over time. And what we observed is that indeed the AGC is intensifying. So we observed in the last few years an increase in the along, um, along mean current velocities. And this coincides with the changes in sea ice concentration that have been observed in the, in, in, in the last years. Um, here I must say that the, the trends uh, of sea ice extent may look a bit different than when you're, what you're used to observe. And that's because we averaged um, each point. Um, so we did weighted average with respect to the uh, so spring and summer uh, seasons, which are the ones that we're able to observe with our MODIS data set. Um, also here to the left, to the right, um, this panel um, compares or is evaluating the correlation between the sea ice extent, which we took from three different data sets, Macy, NSIDC area, and NSIDC extent. And, um, and we're co correlating that against the kurtosis, which again tells us um, how far away from Gaussianity um, our distributions are. So it's the fourth moment of the distributions and it characterizes how long the tails are of their distributions. And just bear in mind that one of these axes is flipped. So that means that um, as ice concentration has decreased over time, we are observing an increase in kurtosis. Um, so, so we observe more tail events as the ice extent decreases, which agrees with the hypothesis that as the spring and summer um, sea ice has decreased in the last few years, there has been an intensification of the sea ice eddy field uh, that would usually be beneath the ice. Um, so we processed um, GPS buoy data sets from the Multidisciplinary Drifting Observatory for the Study of Arctic Climate, the Mosaic Expedition. Um, we obtained buoy trajectories spanning the period between 2019 and 2021. And this is the left panel that you're observing here. Uh, we were able to process 104 trajectories that enter the marginalized zone that, from which we got our observations from the MODIS data set, which you're observing to the right. So in comparison, we had around 200 trajectories that we acquired through MODIS and 100 that we acquired through Mosaic. And um, so just the main um, difference between these data sets, of course, is the hour is the, the acquisition time rate of the observations. So for boys, we have hourly acquisitions, which we time average to remove the effects of high frequency inertial oscillations. And interestingly, for absolute dispersion, we observed that both data sets agree with the same five fourths regime um, that were, was also observed in other in the study by Gabrielski et al. And this highlights the fact that sea ice drift is not a diffusive process. Um, we went ahead and also did a relative dispersion analysis taking into account chance pairs of ice flows as well as mosaic uh, buoys. And again, here the, the goal is to do a roadmap between the exponent law or, or the function that best fits the dispersion um, curve and what that means in terms of the physics. So what dynamics are producing that dispersion law? What we observed with the mosaic data set is three clear and distinctive regimes. So for short time scales of zero to two days, we observed a non-local regime, which means that the structures that more li most likely are making the, the GPS boys move have length scales much larger than the separation of the boys. Um, so this regime was followed by um, t, t to the square and then a t cubed, which is usually uh, related to uh, mesoscale eddies. So in the Richardson regime, which is now local behavior, 
processes uh, have spatial scales similar to the separation between particles. And interestingly, we observe the same T cube regime with our MODIS data set. Um, and this, this regime is usually linked or is characteristic of a uh, cascade of energy. And so it was just very interesting to see that both data sets were able to um, resolve that separation uh, regime. Um, so for our MODIS, we be given the, the initial separation of at least 20 kilometers, given the size of the flows. Uh, for the first uh, few time scales, we, would, we were not able to resolve um, neither a non-local regime nor a ballistic regime for this case. So just to summarize, this new CI drift product bridges the gap between limited in situ measurements and mode models. Um, CI straps in an eddy displace rotation rates matching the vorticity of the underlying turbulent eddy field, and more work is needed to understand potential feedbacks between the CI drift field and the method to submit a scale oceanic turbulent eddy field. I want to thank my group, my collaborators, NASA and ONR for funding. And if you're interested in, in our database, database, I'm putting the QR code right here. Thank you and see you soon in our one hour session.